right. You see our quote today? A L- little divergent from the normal one. What, can anyone quote from memory the famous quote by Burns? A little louder, Lily. <laughs> and, and what was the result of that? It's made all the difference. It's made all the difference. Okay. So a famous quote. Uh, Sam Woodhouse, two rows diversion of wood. Something, something, something. I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. Okay, famous quote. Uh, who's the poet again? Robert Frost. I thought I said Robert Burns, didn't I? <laughs> Got you confused there. Okay. All right. Uh, anyone have any things you have picked up on social entrepreneurship off the internet or newspapers or magazines? Does anyone read, in the last week, has anyone read a physical newspaper? One. I mean, if we'd asked this question 20 years ago, everyone probably would have. Now, you know, people your age don't read the physical newspapers. Uh-huh. Don't what? Uh-huh. Okay, don't you read the news feed off of Yahoo or something? Well, I'm a little older than you, so people might. Do you read the news every day? Or just the sports scores? No, all the time. All the time, huh? Any, any big major news breaking today? Senate race, huh? Gosh, oh, we should have prayed for the elections. Boy, this country needs to heal, doesn't it? It is so divisive this year. I haven't seen it this bad in a long time. Uh, we just need to come together, you know? Are you a Republican? What? Are you a Republican? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm embarrassed by both parties. Let's put it that way. So, but it was funny though. My mother was a diehard Republican her whole life, and on her, you get to choose which party on your income taxes you want to donate three dollars to for the national, you know, election committee. And so, her for her final return after she died, I, I checked her as a libertarian. I thought, oh, I guess she'd like that. <laughs> uh, what's a good, quick, simple definition of social entrepreneurship? Michael, what would you say? <coughs> Tell me in seven words what social entrepreneurship is. All right. Anyone else? Yes. Chat, Thad. Um, I was going to say something different. I kind of forgot. But making a difference um, through enterprise and enterprise. Okay. So you got the, the S, making a difference in social areas through E, entrepreneurship. So using business skills to solve social needs. Business skills, solving social needs. Think of that in your mind. It's just business skills, solving social needs. Good, quick definition when someone asks you. All right. Um, you see, I've already posted assignment 13, so you've had time to work on that or understand what we're doing for Thursday. Um, let me just read it to you if you haven't already thought about it. It goes along with the great ideas. So write 100 words of what you learned at Wednesday's Great Idea Exchange. 100 words or more of what you learned at Thursday's Great Idea Showcase. And so you have two paragraphs to write. Um, If if for some reason you can't be there because of PCC work or your teacher said no, you have to be in class, get someone else's notes and draw from what they had to to put down what you'd like. Uh, Also, I'm going to, next week's assignment will just be one big assignment. And it'll be due a week from Thursday, so there won't be an assignment due next Tuesday. 
and I'll give you a lot longer to think about it and do it. Okay, so it's uh, worth, you know, double the points, so you'll need more time to work on it. And it, it'll be um, a company website that is a social entrepreneurship company uh, out of Europe, and you'll have to explore their website and look at all the things they're doing. Okay, so I, I was trying to think, how can I get you to look at their website and really dig into it and think about what they're doing and analyze it? So I've, I've gone through and pulled out questions from parts of their website to help you look for those things. And, and it's more of a make work assignment, which I don't really like, but I couldn't think of any other way to really help you explore their website. So I would love it if you go beyond the fill in the blank answers and say, why are they doing this? Or I don't like what they're doing here. Okay, that, that'll really earn you a top grade on the assignment. If you just say, you know, I'll ask the question, what does this stand for? And if you find the answer and just, you know, put down the three word answer, you know, that, that's okay, but that, you know, that's just, you know, hunt and, hunt and find, you know, you did that in third grade. Is it really gonna stay in your mind and change your life? So I'd like it if you thought about what you found and, and assimilated it and had it, you know, do something in your life. All right. Tony, what's a quick definition of social entrepreneurship? Good. All right. What did he say? All right, good. All right, let's, let's get that memorized. You know, that's when you just got to know a few certain things. So when people ask you, hey, what was that course all about? You can explain it. You know, you aren't fumbling. You know, that's, that's your elevator speech about what this class is about. All right. Um, at the end of... At the end of class, we'll pass out little strips of paper with your accumulated grades on them. So remind me to get to that, okay? Um, the noise is obviously letting our classmate in India try and hook into the class, so that's okay. That'll happen from time to time. All right, um, how many of you chose for this assignment due today, how many of you chose to write on general, general mental health? Number one, option number one. Okay, how about option number two, homeless? Option number three, personal mental health? I thought we had to do all three. Yeah, just saying, go ahead and finish. <laughs> Pick one of these three options, your choice, okay? All right, but hey, you got, you got triple the benefit, Ryan. You know, the rest of us only <laughs> learned one thing. All right, um, who would like to tell us something you learned that, that you think is meaningful that would help someone else that you learned in the assignment? Was that a hand, or are you just itching your face? Okay. Anthony. Um, I made an observation about my grandfather. Um, he started developing uh, dementia um, after he had retired, probably about 10 years after he retired. He started showing signs of it. My sister noticed it when he kept asking her, so how's Rick's, the college that she used, went to? Like, and it kept every year, like he would keep asking her, like, oh, how's, how's college? She's like, I've been graduating for like 10 years now. Um, but it was slowly slipping away. And he now uh, is uh, remarried, my grandmother's passed away, and his uh, new wife is really just taking care of him. And uh, he was proactive at the beginning of his retirement, but it started to slowly fade. And um, I think that it could have been prevented if there was actions taken place beforehand. And Doing a little research about the mind and how the muscle can deteriorate um, due to diseases and different things like that. Usually when you lose mental capacity, it's very difficult to get it back. 
um, whether it's from accidents if you're 25 or not. Mm -hmm. And if you are losing part of your mental capacity, um, you, it takes a lot of strenuous exercise and time, which old people really don't have. And so I thought it's a lot easier to take preventative measures of dementia than it is to try and recoup from it. Okay. And it's giving them something proactive for that. And I think about all the general authorities, and they're the same age as my grandfather, but they've all got all their wits about them. So um, it's about constant, in my opinion, it's about constantly working that muscle, your brain, constantly doing something, be active mentally. Uh -huh. uh, I had a friend on Facebook, they were coming home Sunday from Dallas. They had four apostles on their flight. And she said it was the safest flight I've ever been on. <laughs> okay. Didn't we talk about uh, last week about the temple is a great way to prevent that and it gives older people something to do? I mean, I, th I think there's a, uh, some real truth in that. Um, I had a friend also on Sunday, he is the branch president at an assisted living home. Uh, and they go to the temple twice a month, and it, it, it's just, you know, a real struggle. They, uh, they actually, one guy went there, and instead of going, you know, getting everyone there together, he, he went on his own and went to the session right before theirs, and, you know, it was going to be a disaster. So they actually went and pulled him out of that session and brought him back to the chapel and had him wait with their group. And this fellow, he, my, my friend sat to him. He, he mouthed and recited the whole temple ceremony the whole time. You know, he has it memorized, but he can't remember short-term memory. He can't remember anything about what happened that day, anything like that, but his long-term memory is, you know, sharper than all of ours. So it's just so frustrating, the, the struggles these people have. All right, anything else on dementia? Yes. I actually like wrote on the same exact thing, um, but I read an article about a study was done last year saying that retirement is directly related to like symptoms of Alzheimer and dementia, and he went on to say that every year that someone worked, every extra year worked would postpone six weeks of the symptoms of dementia or Alzheimer's. So, yeah, I, I came up with an idea, but, yeah. Okay, do you want to share us the idea? Oh, uh, well, it was just, it was like, it's like a nonprofit organization or um, just basic or a program that it would be marketed to like our age group or our parents' age group whose parents are about to retire. And basically it would be an online school um, where they could take courses and get, and get just certificates after they finish. So like if you know someone was studying like a foreign language, like they would study language and then they'd have the opportunity to sign up with you know the group online to go to that country for a few weeks, or if they were taking like a history program, they could whatever period they were studying at the end of the semester, they could go on like a trip with that group and you know kind of see the sites of what they were studying. And that kind of stuff. Oh, that sounds promise. I'd like to. Is that your great idea? No, that was just. Are you presenting a great idea? No. Hurry and write that one up. No. Seriously, I, I like that idea a lot. I think, I think that has some real appeal. All right. Anything else on dementia? Or can you, did someone want to make a comment on dementia but you've forgotten now what you wanted to say? <laughs> All right, what else about mental health? All right. That. Um, I have, mine is more focused on myself individually. Okay. Um, but I don't know if it's true, but I have this, uh, I have this belief or idea that mental health is, uh, or at least my mental health, our own, our own mental health is very unknown. Uh, in other words, you can be physically unhealthy and, and see it because it's physically evident, but um, if you're mentally unhealthy, it's unless unless you're suffering dementia or or insanity, it's it's pretty much not evident. But I think even 
there's different levels of mental health even if even if you're not to the point of dementia or whatever. Um, and that is in, in making decisions and 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 solving problems and um, keeping your, your your wits about you. And and I think that if you're not constantly improving, if you're if you're uh, just living day to day on habits and, and not um, developing your mental capacity, then I believe that you'll just get stuck in, a, in one same mindset and you'll live through, through habits the rest of your life and, and you're not really progressing. And I think a good social entrepreneur needs to have a sharp mind, a, a fit mind, instead of just a, a, an unhealthy mind, you know what I mean? I need to be in tune and, and mentally fit in order to make the right decisions, to be able to be self-disciplined, to, to uh, make the decisions necessary to uh, succeed, you know what I mean? And so, so I think it's important to make special efforts every day to um, strengthen your mind. As, as, as he was saying, how it's, it's sort of like a muscle, you have to exercise it. And I think it's important that we, we exercise self-discipline and, um, and spend time. I and mean, as students, it's easy because we're always constantly studying and also constantly improving. But once we get out of that and fall into the habit of daily routine, <coughs> uh, I think we can kind of set certain neural paths in our mind that are constant. And we need to change that up so that our mind is healthy. Okay. What? Have you heard that a lot of the great artists throughout history have had mental health problems? Well, that's how they get their inspiration by. <laughs> I, I, that's an interesting idea. I mean, can they get their inspiration only that way? Well, that is easy. <laughs> I, mean, I would hope not. I would hope that people who are mentally fit, physically and emotionally fit, can be in tune with the spirit, and the spirit opens up windows of creativity that they hopefully can't only get if they're mentally off balance. That, that would be a little scary. Um, so that, that's a whole interesting issue is, do you force people that are mentally off to get help, to get medicated, and then they lose some other aspects of maybe their artistic side? You know, a lot, of, a lot of issues in the social arena, if you think about it, they might violate uh, our agency. I mean, how many, how many homeless people really don't want to change their lifestyle? There's, I think there's a, a significant number. You, you bring them out and give them a place to be, and a year later they're back on the streets because that's really what they feel more comfortable in. So do you force them to go live someplace? Those are, those are some interesting you know, choices that uh, you have to face in the social arena. A couple of hands, Tony, Anthony, and then Max. Uh, as a social entrepreneur, I, it's hard for me to, I don't want to believe that anybody is mentally ill. I believe that people- well, uh, Let me just see what you just said. You don't want to believe anyone is mentally ill? Yes. Okay. I that people operate in different realms, and that if you if you're the same frequency with them, you will see them as balanced. So because we have different realms that we operate in, you can one person might see the other as sick, and that person in turn might see you like you're not getting it. So I believe that if you understand how each person feels, create. Uh, a great opportunity for them to work based on their um, mind state that you see everybody pretty much working, doing well in their special right. If I understood a little bit what you're saying is mental health is sort of in the eye of the beholder? Yes. Okay. Does everyone understand the difference between subjective and objective? You know, tangible evidence, facts for coming to a conclusion. Subjective is more subject to your own views, opinions, perspective, and not as clear cut as this. 
Okay, so used in many fields, you know, objective versus subjective. Um, how many? How many agree with Tony's idea? I, I think it was. I think it was Abigail. Your your assignment talked about m people that are mentally healthy in one culture might be considered in another culture to not be so mentally healthy just because of cultural norms around the world. Okay. Um, is that a little bit what you were trying to say, Tony? Oh, the cultural part uh, is not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying that if you meet a homeless person and you spend time with them, you see that they are thinking differently from you. And they might be thinking that you don't get certain things that they are trying to explain to you, while you think that they are not making sense. So it just, we are not approaching okay. okay. So it is very subjective. I mean, if I have a broken leg, everyone in the room can probably agree whether I have a broken leg or not, right? There's some visible evidence versus if you think I'm mentally unstable, I might be able to convince a few of you that I'm not and the rest of you will still think, oh, he's, he's really off kilter, okay? So the mental health issues are a lot harder to diagnose and to decide whether there is a problem or not, right? Okay. All right, Talk, uh, Anthony, we went to you next. Um, no, I kind of have a theory in the idea that uh, people who develop um, uh, like dementia or have issues of mental health, um, and it just kind of spans or spark from that idea that a lot of artists get that, is because you're starting to, um, and I think even with my grandfather, um, you start to think about, or you think more, and you let you don't communicate, or you communicate less. If that makes sense, you stop uh, serving, thinking about other people, or uh, doing stuff for other people, and you're more introspective. You think more to yourself. You're quiet and alone, and um, doing things uh, that are more kept to yourself. And so like, and it actually goes the same with what Tony had said, is that um, you have your own idiosyncrasies and a lot of people will view that as different or odd, like you're very strange, are you mentally all there? Um, because based on your performance, what you do or what you say. On my mission we had an older stranger fellow and he would talk in riddles and it, we spent a lot of time with him, and just like Tony said, you kind of have to get their point of view. You have to get into their head and understand what they're saying or what it's being interpreted as. Um, it's like if we were to go to an Eskimo village, we need to understand them, so we need to observe and kind of communicate on, on the same level. He would talk about this bird all the time. He was talking about the chirping noises at an intersection when, for blind people. And I, it was like, it was the farthest, most strangest, random thing and uh, it didn't make any sense, but eventually we were able to, if you want to crack his code, so to speak, on his riddles and stuff. And he did, he enjoyed talking like that. But if he was just to try and communicate with somebody in natural, they're like, this guy is wacko. Put him in an institution uh -huh. because he's got issues. Uh -huh. But I think that um, if you kind of choose to separate yourself, um, kind of like artists do, or you stop serving others, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're commanded to always serve, is because it helps us to keep, I guess, right. focused, or on the right path. I don't know how to say that properly, but All right. it's just in the right way. This reminds me of possibly the greatest error in social entrepreneurship, is when person with good intentions comes into another area with which they aren't fully familiar and they impose their type of solution on the other people's situation or culture. And we've seen that around the world. Uh, you know, the American way is best and we got to do it this way when we go into Africa or South America. And I, I think that's one of the biggest problems you'll see in history is social entrepreneurs trying to impose their solutions, their perspective. Oh, you cannot talk in riddles, mister. You, you have to talk the way I talk or there's something wrong with you. 
All right, so that, that in your social entrepreneurship ventures, be aware of the other person's point of view. I mean, that, that's just such a simple thing, but we so often forget it that, you know, we just want to go in and fix it. What, what's the main issue with the difference, well, not the main, but one of the key differences between men and women? And I'll, I'll give you an example of this. I, I remember with my first wife, I, I still remember, I, I can tell you, the place we were in the car driving on the freeway, the exit we were getting off, when she finally said to me, Mark, I just want you to listen and understand my problems. I don't want you to fix them. <laughs> okay? So very, very traditionally, women, they want to share, have you feel that you're, they're being understood, but they don't want their companions or the men in their lives to immediately fix it. Men are more fixers. That, that's our nature. We, we're more efficient. We want to get things done, solve the problem, move on. Don't continue stressing and worrying about it. Let's just solve it. And so be aware of that, you know, if that's a situation in your couple's relationships. Okay. Uh, Ashlyn, do you want, does that happen to you yet? Oh, yeah, all the time. But, um... <laughs> oh, we lost you. Oh, all right, Max. Oh. Oh, you're not. Um, I was just thinking, Anthony mentioned that with mental illness, maybe they wouldn't lose any or lose their capacity that they would serve. And um, also, I think that there's a difference between losing your mind because you're not using it and never having a mind that mentally functions correctly because I think it's important to make a distinction that there are severe mental illnesses where people never really had the ability in the first place to have their own agency. Or they develop those where they can't, they become dangerous to themselves because to themselves and others that are on medication or if they don't have the medication treatment and situations like that Obviously, we're just going to scratch the surface of mental health in our discussion. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of different mental health issues to discuss. We could, you could take a whole college career discussing mental health with all the things there are, as Ashlyn said, you know, things from birth or things that have developed later on in life, et cetera, you know. So we're Disclaimer, we just aren't going to be able to get to everything. All we're trying to do is, remember, light the fire in your minds to get something burning for you to think about it and take it from here. Okay? A, a teacher is not to wrap up this nice little present, nice little bow, really nice, and to give it to you all gift wrap, and that's your education. No, we just give you the ideas, and something strikes you and say, yeah. You know, that bolt of lightning, that aha, and then you run with it and you do something well beyond the boundaries of this classroom. Max, have you forgotten your comment? You, we told you, we uh, said we'd get to you. So far ago, it's not relevant anymore. Okay, sorry. All right, any other comments that you started to bring that we, we didn't get a chance to tell you about? Okay. All right, um, so general, mental health. Anything else on general mental health of the population? Ryan? Um, there's a, a talk given by uh, Elder Morrison of the 70s. It's called Myths About Mental Illness. <coughs> and I would suggest reading that. Because uh -huh. it will clear up a lot of the myths that we've talked about here. And it's pretty lengthy and you know, we, we don't need to really get into it in class, but I would highly recommend it. Elder Morrison has really become a champion of mental health in the church. I, I think he's had some family experience with it. Does he mention that? Not the article, but I've, I've heard him speak in other arenas where I think uh -huh. he seems to have a, a child or something. A close knowledge of it. But. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing to look is uh, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. 
NAMI, National Association for Mental, for the Mentally Ill. Very good organization. If you want more research, go to their website and, and look at that. It, it, it's, a, it's a tough issue. I mean, as we talked about just throwing open the curtains and letting the sun come in, I mean, people, people think that that's all you need to do. Just get out of bed and start walking and breathing deeply and smelling the fresh air and, and seeing the sunlight, and you'll feel better. Well, if it's a serious disease, you know, <laughs> Just by taking your broken leg out in the sunshine isn't going to cure your broken leg. And the same thing with the mental health issues. Just doing things that might pep you up if it is just some mild depression. You know, a little bit of the blues, you know, you're just down. Yes, changing your environment has some impact on that. I, I, I know a lot of people that are affected, what is it called? A, it has to do with the weather. I can't remember the exact name of it. but. What is it? Seasonal yeah, seasonal affective disorder. Yeah, the, 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 the bad overcast weather causes them to feel overcast in their mental health. And so literally getting them to a warmer, sunnier climate changes that. So that's, that's one of the easy ones to take care of. You know, the, the ones multiple personalities, schizophrenia, uh, paranoid, uh, you know, bipolar, you know, those are much, much harder to deal with. And again, so, so difficult to understand. And you have to think, why does God let these people have these issues? I mean, as Ashlyn said, people that have from birth have not been able to make choices. You know, they haven't been able to use their agency. Why, why did they come to earth then if if they never were, had the mental functioning to exercise that and show what they could do. You know, so I, I'm just totally amazed all the time at, at how well planned out Heavenly Father made this earthly test. I mean, there are so many little nuances and facets of it that he, he just has not made it easy to crack the code. You know, he, he has left room for so many people to have doubts and, and to really exercise deep faith when things seem so cloudy to them. All right, how about issues on the homeless? What struck you on homelessness? Uh, a lot of your answers, I read some of your papers already, fairly similar. Uh, you know, is there anything that you think is really an innovative idea. Most of you that talked about homelessness talked about giving them an opportunity to have a job. That if they have a job, that will be one of the things that will help them get off the streets. Okay. Any other things on homelessness that you can think about? Michael. Uh, this, uh, this is just something that I was uh, thinking of employment with uh, my uh, great ideas. But with a lot of the homeless issues, I think like getting a job and getting a place to, uh, place to stay at home um, are good things, but like you were mentioning earlier, those aren't going to solve the problem. Um, a lot of times people are in those kind of positions because they don't have the knowledge that they need about the actions that they need to take in order to improve their status in life.
So I took away from what you just said that the, the, the issue is very complex. Many different facets. It's not just finding them a place to live. Max? Professional beggars out there who live in two million dollar homes, and so like part of the problem is if you want to try and find people who are homeless, you got to find the ones who are actually are committed to getting into a better situation, and not just there to be like, oh look, he's going to give me free clothes or whatever. And those who are committed to changing because they want to actually live a more significant life than just I can get free stuff from you and not have the responsibility to care about it, because there are quite a few of those out there, like it or not. I've seen a lot of them on my mission. Mm -hmm. uh when I worked in downtown Los Angeles, uh, they actually gave out cards for people to give out to the beggars with four or five addresses in the downtown Los Angeles area where they could go and get food and help and shelter. So when someone came up to you and wanted money, you say, here's where I donate my money to these places where you can go and get the real help you need. So that was one solution that some people had, right? I was just going to say that I don't think as social entrepreneurs it's, it's our role to judge those people. And, uh, you know, we should still look at them as for who they are as, as, as people. And even though, you know, you may have these ideas that they truly don't need, <coughs> maybe they do. And it's not really for us to make that decision. So I think we need to be careful and make sure that even though you know, you may think this person is living in a $2 million house. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're sleeping under the stars mm -hmm. every night. And mm -hmm. so we, they're still people. They're still children of God, um, regardless of where they sleep. We should, mm -hmm. you know, we should look at them as Christ-like as possible. Uh -huh. do, you, um, do you give out free tacos to someone that comes and says, I don't have any money? What if they came every day? I don't know. I mean, I don't have people coming every day, but it's, mm -hmm. it's the idea that if you can, then I feel like you should. And, mm -hmm. you know, my mission, we, we would invite people to eat because we didn't have money to give people, but we would invite them to, you know, come and eat a meal. And most of the people would, you know, they, they obviously didn't want that. But there were times when, when that was what, really what they needed, and it turned out to be a, a good experience. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the idea that someone who is taking away resources from you, maybe, and, and we can't, you're, I know what you're saying, we can't judge whether, what their motives are or what their true nature is, but should we be a little bit careful that we don't give too much of our resources to the most vocal person, or the person that comes by the most often. You know, it is, I, I understand what you're saying, I understand what you're saying, but is there, is there some point you need to be aware of on both sides of that, that you shouldn't let yourself be totally taken advantage of because then you are not having the resources to give to people who really might be in need? Hammond? Some of them, or well, most of them, could get help, but a lot of them could deal drugs. You know, could deal drugs and could just get high, you know. Mm -hmm. Right outside the doorstep. You know, I don't know if you've been to any of them here in Hawaii, but a lot of them I've seen, not only here, but in New York and everywhere else I've been. Mm -hmm. You can't really turn them away either, you know. Is there an analogy between mental health helping people that don't want your help? and you're trying to convince them that they do need help, and, and your work as a, a missionary when you're trying to convince people that they really could have a better life with the gospel? I mean, how many times, you know, you're, you're out there trying to help people have the vision of what the gospel could do to change their life? Isn't, isn't that what similar 
hurdle we face in trying to help some of the homeless to know what it's like not to be homeless so they can choose and say, wow, I, do I want to be on the streets or let me understand what I really could have my life be like? You know, a lot of people, what is it, uh, section 124, I think they know uh, they would embrace the gospel, but they know not where to find the truth. Yeah. So part of our job is to give them the resources and the skills and the knowledge so they can make informed choices and then choose to have the lifestyle they want to have. That? Oh, Ashlyn? Now, how did she tell you that she wanted to talk? She texted it. She writes it on Oh, okay. All right. Ashlyn. This is her um, hand. This is my hand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I was actually just going to mention what you just said. I think that poverty tends to be a mentality. They don't understand what life could be like. And sometimes it's scary to make big life changes. And so when they start to have opportunities, there's a whole lot of issues that they have getting out of that type of a life. It, I see it. In another context, I see it with my friends who are over 30 and unmarried. They are scared, a lot of them, to change their life. They're very comfortable being single. The thought of coming together and sharing their life after so many years of singlehood with someone else and changing their routines and all that, that's pretty tough. So you have to help people have the knowledge to make choices. Yes. On my mission, we were encouraged. On my mission, we were encouraged not to give money to homeless people, and I learned that firsthand why. And you know, I had some extra leftover cash, and so I, I, I think I gave out like a total of like eight bucks to like three different people in the park. And I, honestly, goodness, within five minutes, we were almost practically like not getting mobbed, but they just like they came out of the woodwork, man, out of the bushes, and. You wave a dollar in the air, and these people just came from all over. And then every single day, leaving our, our apartment, it was just, it was like this like like shark fest, you know. People just coming up out of that door because like all those those Mormon kids are everything else. And I couldn't even eight bucks, seven eight bucks, you know. Anyways, I learned why that was. They didn't want like you have. I, it's like you can like that, that like that parable. You can give a man a fish and feed him for a day, or you. And so I saw then why we were encouraged as missionaries not to give up. Plus, those, those funds were sacred for us, whatever. But um, yeah, I think that's, I think that, that there was a lot of experience that I had. You know, so. All right, we have time for one quick comment, and then we want to change subjects. I think, I think whatever system you enact, you're going to have to have a method in place to figure out those who want the change and those who aren't going to change and just want you to perpetuate them not helping themselves. Because you're not helping somebody who doesn't want to help themselves by giving them exactly what they ask for and keeping them in the same spot. You're really not helping them at all. You're perpetuating the system and you're doing a disfavor for them. By saying, oh, well, you can't change. Here's $5 to go spend on whatever. You know, it's, you're not doing them a favor at all. It, it reminds me on election day today, I, 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 I'm going to totally butcher the quote and the idea, but something about when societies realize that the people they vote for will give them things to stay in office. You know, they'll open the, the treasury doors and you will vote for the people who open the doors the widest, you know, is going to lead to the, the downfall of your society. You know, because there'll be come the time when there are not enough people producing and everything is just going back out as freebies to too much of the society that is just addicted to the, the handouts from the government. Um, any last comments on the third topic, personal mental health? Anything that you really want to share, make sure people know? Uh, a lot of you commented how the, the overlap of the gospel is really effective in keeping positive mental health. You know, that obeying gospel principles is the key to having a, a good, sharp uh, mental health situation. 
Uh, I told you I, I was going to tell you my story about my hoarder friend. When I lived in a little town in uh, California, uh, there was the weird old lady in the ward. And the, the kids would try to reach out to her. They'd go sing Christmas carols at Christmas time to her, and she would throw things at the Christmas carolers. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, she'd get up in fast meeting and just ramble about who knows what. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was sad to see that she wasn't in tune with the rest of the war. That was, that was the hard part, you know. People can be eccentric and you can love their, their idiosyncrasies. And then there's just people that are just so odd that they push people away, you know. And uh, when this lady died, and, and so she pushed everyone away. I, I never personally went to her house until she died. And then the bishop said, we need help cleaning up her house. She was a hoarder, and her home was stacked. It was like a maze inside her house with things stacked. And so, you know, you had to just, we, we tried to go out and help to start clean up the house, but it was, it was a major undertaking. But the, the interesting part of the story was about three years later, I had moved to another area, and I had met a fellow down in my new neighborhood who was uh, a church historian buff. He liked to uh, collect rare church books. And I remember one day he came down and showed me, he said, look at, look at this wonderful book I just bought. And I looked at it and thought, I know this person. This was the scriptures of the hoarder lady. And it turned out she was the sister of Cleon Skousen, an interesting church author, you know, in the 20th century. And he had had lots of general authorities come to his home over the years. And so every time an apostle came, she had had the apostle sign her scriptures. So my friend had bought these scriptures for $3,000. It was one of the best preserved examples of, of the most signatures of general authorities in one place, you know, famous apostles. And I thought to myself, if I had been a better neighbor and ward member and reached out to her, you know, when I lived in her neighborhood while she was still alive, she might have given me that book. <laughs> All right. Pick, pick up your books if you have them. I had a chance to. Was uh, interesting. Uh, the reading. The reading. I, I actually, I thought, wow, I really, you know, sometimes you read it a second time and it's either more boring or this time to me, I, I mean, like here was one page, or was it? Uh, I had a whole, I mean, you know, I, I got thoughts on that page. There's one page, I had a whole thought. I wrote down the whole margin of the book there, so I can't remember where it was now. Oh, there it is. And I had a whole thought that came to me. Um, so, the main person in these chapters, uh, Bill Drayton. Where did he go to, to school? Where? Harvard? Okay. He went to, to high school to an elite prep school, so he came from a very well-to-do family. Okay. But he was turned towards social things. Do you remember who his, his four heroes were growing up? Who? Gandhi. Gandhi. Ashoka. A U.S. politician, Thomas Jefferson, 
And the fourth one was a guy from Europe that, that brought about uh, the European Union movement. So those were his four heroes. And when he was picking a name for his social enterprise, he didn't want a name that was associated with any one country. You know, he wanted it to be more universal. He didn't want it to be a name of a person. But anyway, I don't think he quite got his parameters, but he came up, he used the name of his hero, uh, Ashoka. Am I pronouncing that right? Ashoka, yeah, I think so. And now it's in 46 countries. That was as of the date of this book, 2004. So they're probably in more than 46 countries now. They had assisted 1,400 entrepreneurs, and they provided more than 40 million in direct funding. How many staff members do they have? You know, here, here's a, a social enterprise. They have 120 staff members. What's their, what do you think their annual budget is? I mean, just guess. Just use a, just what are their personnel costs going to be for 120 staff members? I mean, give me somebody, someone give me a ballpark. How are you going to think through this? What? How much, is, how much are they going to pay an average staff person, would you say? A little louder. I'd probably say between eight and 12. Uh, dollars an hour? Okay. Hey, give me an annual salary. I, I, okay, I picked 50. You know, I mean, here's a guy from Harvard. He probably has Harvard type friends, you know, Washington, D.C. area friends. You know, so I picked 50. So already, just in salaries, $6 million a year. Um, what's a good rule of thumb? Is, is the salary all you have to pay for someone? No. What, what's a rule of thumb, Ryan? Do you use a rule of thumb at your uh, business? You have to factor in 20 to 30% more, just depending on what the taxes are in your state. So like the flight okay. You know, the vacation. Uh, healthcare, healthcare, insurance. Okay. Yeah, so when you pay someone $50,000, you're, you're probably going to have another. Fifteen to twenty thousand dollars associated with that person every year, so it's just not their salary. You're gonna for every person you decide to hire, it's gonna cost you more like seventy thousand dollars a year. So you have to factor in benefits and overhead and things to go along with that. Okay. Um, now here's an interesting question. Yeah, does it, does anyone remember what Ashoka does? Can can someone describe what his organization he set up to do? To help find people that essentially could be great social entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah, he wanted to find the people that were going to become great social entrepreneurs and, and have amazing ideas and help them get to that point. So he wanted to find them while they were still basically in, in junior high and help them get through high school and college level social entrepreneurship to get to really some amazing graduate level work. Okay, so that was his goal. I, I have a question. I wrote at the top of my book here, I said, do we need a Mormon Ashoka? Do we need to have a mechanism within the gospel to take amazing young people and, and really help them do phenomenal things. Would that help? I think we have something from the beginning of phases institute outside of, uh, you know, church and even BYU. Uh, there's an institute of religion to be able to kind of uh, help progress that along, but I don't think it's nearly to this level, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Institute helps out with, you know, some of the basic knowledge. April? Um, the perpetual education fund. Okay. It's really a big help for most of the Filipinos because it allows them to go to school. And most of them who are recipients of that fund is those who are, can't really, doesn't really have the means to go get 
education. Right. Is there, beyond the basics though, you know, Institute is open to everyone who wants to take it. Perpetual Education Fund is, is getting to be reasonably widespread. Is there an opportunity to really mentor some of the really special spirits that are going to be our future LDS Gandhis? I, I thought, I, I was energized by that idea. I thought, wow, maybe we can take what he's doing with Ashoka and apply it in our, our gospel realm. Joni? I think that's kind of what Brother Richie is trying to do with his launching leaders over in Asia. Mm -hmm. that. Yes, but I'm, I'm thinking that's more just to try and help more of the general masses. I mean, we are losing so many of our young people in, in countries around the world. I mean, 9% activity rate in the New Zealand young adults. You know, 90% of them we're losing. So launching leaders is trying to save another 20, 30, 40% of them. In, in this Mormon Ashoka idea, we're trying to find the two or three Gandhis that are really going to shake up the world. Okay. So I'm talking about not just college for the masses, I'm talking about the special, you know, Rhodes Scholarship type things for just the very few that have some really special abilities. Do I see another hand someplace? Okay. Max, did you want to say something? Okay. Um, Interesting how you guys, I get the feeling like anything you've learned from the book hasn't sunk in. Yeah. And, and that's okay, because that's the way things normally are. You read something and then three weeks later, you can't remember it, it didn't change your life. Yeah. So, and some of you may be bored or frustrated that sometimes we keep going over some of the basics in class. Like, this today will not be the last day that I ask you for an elevator speech on what social entrepreneurship is. And hopefully by the end of the course, all of you will give your six or seven word definition, and some of you are already bored with that because you, on day three, you already had a good definition in your mind. But we, we go over some of the basics to hopefully get them so ingrained in you that it becomes part of your nature. And it becomes you, and it's just not something you have a note in a book or a note in a folder, and after this class is over, you put it on your shelf, and it's going to collect dust, and you'll never use it. What we're hoping is four or five or ten things you will have enjoyed and learned and lit a fire in you so much in this class that they'll stay with you. And 20 years from now, you'll say, I remember something we, we learned in that room 134 in the McKay classroom building and it stuck with me my whole life. That's what we're trying to shoot for here. Just giving you memorization and, and basic little social entrepreneurship tidbits isn't going to help you. We want to have something that will last into 2011. <laughs> how, many, how many of your classes from spring semester or, you know, six months ago, are you really still have in your mind right now? Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully, you know, part of the college experience is to give you the skills to keep learning forever and not just give you forced memorization experiences in college. We want to give you the skills so you can keep learning for the rest of your life. And hopefully something we'll say in social entrepreneurship class here will give you a love for SE that will stay with you the rest of your life. And wherever you are, whatever calling you have in the church, or you know, whether you're a Relief Study President, I mean, isn't a Relief Study President, one of her main duties is dealing with the social welfare of her ward? 
And if you can do that in a creative way and use some of the principles you learned in this class, we will have done something good for the future of your ward by what we talked about in class here. I saw something, Michael. Oh, okay. So uh, I didn't really think about this this past week because we were in terms, but when I was reading through on page 52, uh, I thought the last paragraph down there was actually kind of lame. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, it talked about uh, the need for uh, three dominant human motivations that we need with our uh, affiliation and achievement. And mentions that those people that have a need for achievement tend to be less influenced uh, than others by suggestions as to what they should do, think, or do. And uh, it goes on and talks about um, they, they tend to be less informed. That's Michael's highlighted one of the key pages in the book. So fold down, you know, I've already folded down page 52, and you can see how much I've underlined and started. His, his idea he talked about was a, a three-star idea that I had underlined in my book here. Um, McClellan has done some basic work in a landmark book called The Achieving Society. And he found that there were three Maine, he called them dominant human, mo human motivations. The need for power, the need for affiliation, the need for achievement. And he found the one most correlated with so social entrepreneurs was achievement. They wanted to make something happen in the world. And that led them to their social entrepreneurship uh, endeavors. Um, and a couple other things Michael said that you may not have heard since he was speaking this way in a softer voice than mine, uh, he talked about they preferred to get advice from experts than friends, uh, and they tended to be more conservative, strangely enough. They weren't big risk takers. Which, that sort of struck me on the surface as being counterintuitive. You'd think an entrepreneur would be one that would you know, be willing to take some risks, and he said they tended, in fact, for example, in to be conservative in games of chance, but daring in games of skill, While, which they did because they had great confidence in their own skills where they could change something. It was part of their control, but in games of chance, you know, it was random. So they were more conservative because they realized they weren't going to be able to influence the outcome. Um, so I think that's the opposite of what you would expect. Uh, the main determinant of success, they thought, was their skill. Uh, they weren't really money driven. They were more driven by the actual achievement. Uh, profits were important because they gave the entrepreneur definitive knowledge of their competence. So money was only used as a scorekeeping tool not really trying to get money in and of itself. You know, I, I think you've seen that uh, in the Social Network movie. How many of you have seen the Social Network movie? Where the guy who started Facebook, he wasn't really driven by money. Money, in the movie, they portrayed it as really not something that he really even cared about much. He was driven by a whole other set of issues. Um, here was an interesting little tidbit. Have you ever had a leader that made you feel like you were their best friend or you were number one in their life? How many, how many parents can make each of their kids feel 
like they're their favorite kid. And so every kid says, who's, who's, you know, who's your dad's favorite? And every kid will raise their hand because they think, you know, of the 10 kids in the family, all 10 think that they're the, the favorite of the dads. So the, one of the points they make here is, and like all good leaders, he made people feel bigger, not smaller. He made people feel bigger, not smaller. Um, Drayton talked about what he liked about Gandhi. He was most interested in his hows, how Gandhi crafted his strategy, how he built his organization, how he marketed his idea. Uh, do you remember the story about the salt march? They, he, he started this march of 241 miles to the sea to pick up the salt that was naturally there instead of paying the British the tax to use the British supplied salt. And they, the press weren't allowed to cover this. And yet, by his going on this 241 mile multi-day journey, it captivated the world's attention. You know, everyone knew about it, even though there wasn't supposed to be any press coverage. The press, it was a, the British had said it was illegal to cover it. So that was one good example of how he marketed his ideas. He got all this coverage of what he did. And remember what he, it turned out that he had 60,000 people followed his example and were arrested for getting salt as well. I remember they talked about they would go and get the salt and the British so policemen and soldiers would come up and hit them with a club. And that, that was a pretty dramatic story. I, I'd like to see more about that. JJ. Uh, Brother Matheson, how do you apply yourself if you want to talk to someone like they're your best friend? How do you go with the right strategy or that you're not talking to them like they're an object or just something you're trying to get something from? How do you get yourself those motives and how do you talk to them? Sorry. What, what comes immediately to your mind? How would you answer JJ's question? How did the Savior do it? Practice. Practice, okay. Hey, but what else? You really care. I mean, it's like being real. Just actually caring. Instead of just talking about conversation. Or yeah, can, can your home teaching situations, can they really tell if you're there because you're assigned to get it done by the end of the month so you can tell people you had 100%? Or can they tear you really know if you care about them as a person and you're there because you really want to do your duty to them and the Lord. So I, I would say that that's probably the basic thing is it comes down to the basic innate love you have for the people. If you don't really love the homeless and really spend time with them and what, what has happened to me, for example, like uh, I was called as a scoutmaster about three years ago, and I, I'm getting too old for winter camps, and our first winter camp was actually the worst night of my life. It was, it was real, seriously horrible. I, I vowed never to go on another winter camp. Um, and so I was worried, you know, I'm now 53. I was worried about relating to 12-year-old boys and it was amazing to me to see how God granted me love for them that I didn't think I had in me. You know, here, here's a, a thing I've learned. You know, one of the hardest things I think Jesus said to do was love your enemies. And I read that so many times and said, how do you love your enemies? <laughs> I can barely love my wife and my kids who I really do love. I mean, you know, I mean, it's hard to be nice to the people you do love, let alone be nice to the people you don't like, right? So how do you love your enemies? And I compared it to a downspout, you know, for catching the rain. And you have the roof, and then you have the little downspout. And the water collects all up here, and then is channeled through that one downspout. 
And I realize the only way I'm going to love my enemies is if I collect God's love for them and I just channel it. It comes down and it's not my love. I'm just letting God's love come in through me and then giving it out to my enemies. Because I don't have enough love in me of my own love that is centered in me to give it out to my enemies. So I need to borrow God's love and just channel it out to them. Okay. Say aye. I sometimes agree with you about love your enemy, but sometimes maybe your enemy will be bully to you. The, the bullies? Yeah, like maybe they will treat you mean to like bully. Okay. And so Jesus said, if they're mean back to you, then you can stop loving them? <laughs> no, your, your enemies are your enemies because they're hard to love. They're mean to you. you know? So Jesus didn't say you're off the hook. He said you still have to love them. But it's hard. I mean, I'm sorry, but uh, like, remember the lady of the, about the smells? I mean, helping the homeless is hard sometimes because they smell bad. I have a hard time kissing my wife sometimes because she doesn't like to brush her teeth. I don't, you know, I'm, you know. I mean, I mean, there's things that put barriers between us and other people and make us come, come away from them. We're repelled by them. And we have to find ways to get closer to them even though we don't want to. And so I've found the only way I can do that is to have a miracle. I mean, I can honestly say, I love each and every one of you in this class. Some of you I know more than others. Some of you I've had some more interaction with. But I can say I love each of you, and so that's why I want to serve you. And it's not anything I've really done. It's some magic thing that happens when we do our part, Heavenly Father just sort of touches our hearts and lets it happen. Like with my scouts. I, I was worried, like this last year, you know, I, I loved the kids I've been with for the first year or two, and then I thought, well, those 11 year olds coming up in the scout troop, I'm not so sure. They're, they look, oh, they're, ugh, you know? My first impression was, I'm not going to be able to love them like the other boys. Then they come into the troop, and whew, the goof-off, stupid kid, I loved him. I didn't want to love him, but somehow God transformed and let it happen. So it was, it was cool. Joy, uh, Jill, sorry. Um, my mom would always share with us um, when we'd come home with a bad, from a bad day at school or growing up. <laughs> and she'd always come back and say, yeah, you know, just kill them with kindness, you know, just smile at them and confuse the heck out of them. <laughs> and they won't know what to do, but they'll just want to smile back and, and you know, it'll be better. And, you know, we, I never understood that till years later. Uh, and she'd always do that, and that was just in her, in her, I guess, in herself to always just show kindness to others and and make the effort, even though it was hard sometimes, a lot of times, to do that to people that you don't care for or that just stroke you the wrong way. And yet she would continue to make that effort. And it wasn't until after she passed away that those people, you know, that we've come in contact, like her children would come in contact, they would share with us, oh, you know, I'm so-and-so, you know, your mom was such a wonderful woman. You know, they would share all of her uh, loving attributes, and, and they would share things that we never knew that she did. And, you know, it just shows that even though these are, it, it's not even, it's very hard to show love to your enemies. But when we're there, we make the effort, and we do, you know, we can kill them with kindness like that. You know, it does. It takes away the the bad feelings that you might harbor within you. Yeah. That, that whole forgiveness thing is just a miracle. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense, logically. 
So it just is amazing how God makes it happen. Yeah. One thing that struck me, I'll share just a little story, then we'll get to grades here. I remember when I was at Harvard, I felt I needed to smile all the time. So I would walk around Harvard with this sort of plastic smile on my face because I wanted everyone to think, wow, that Mormon guy, he's always smiling. Well, I better go check out his church because he's always smiling. And I realized, you know, that really wasn't an effective proselyting tool because people could see whether it was really true and deep or not. I mean, I have a friend, I love him dearly, but he puts on this cheesy smile. You know, it, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't warm your heart, it doesn't, you know, you know, it'd be better if he just had a, you know, a, a funky, you know, because <laughs> it, it would be more genuine. So, so the bottom line takeaway from that is, is employ the principles of the gospel in your leadership and your social entrepreneurship interactions and just be genuine and beg for God's mercy to change you and to be an instrument in his hands to do the good you want to do and do it in your style, in, in, in your way and don't try to feel like you have to do it Gandhi's way or Bill Drayton's way or you know this other way. The, the beauty of, of service is God will take everyone with your, their unique abilities and let you be that kind of person, you know, and he'll use you whatever way he can. And it won't be the way he'll use your neighbor, but he'll still be effective. All right. Still trying to figure out a good way to get you grades here. So... Um, I'm going to pass these out. Yeah, do you want to take half of those? And I tried to get these up and through assignment 10, I think it is. Uh, Actually, Mike, let me need yours back because yours has the top part on it. Uh oh. This one doesn't have who's who here. Who would be first? Seth? Are these out of anything in particular? It's, it's, an string of numbers. it's a random string of numbers. Just, I just typed in, you know, like a monkey just pounding on the keyboard and this. No, no. That's how you <laughs> Like, oh yeah, is there like a... Answer, right? Yeah. Do you have the variable numbers of points? Are they all at 10 or what? Uh, variable number. We'll give you that string here. That's why I need Michael's back to... So if there's a zero... Kimball? Well, you get the big one. Okay, so most of the assignments were worth 10, a little bit different. Uh, and obviously, your name is truncated, so hopefully, we got your full name. Mike, can I have it back? All right, so. First column, some of you have threes. If you responded to the email the very first week of class and let me know you got your emails, you got three points for that. Uh, you get 10 points for coming and walking with me or having lunch with me. So that's not a required one, but those are just 10 bonus points. So some of you have points there and some of you don't. The first one is assignment one, and then six is your classroom. Uh, possibilities for attendance and participation that day. Um, uh, do, you, do you want me to read off, the, continue across the top so you can write, or do you, if you have, probably those of you, most of you don't need to care about if you know, if you're in the A, B level, 
you probably don't need to worry about it. If you see some blanks there on yours and you're in the C or D level, email me or come talk to me and I can tell you exactly what assignment you're missing, okay? And what, what, the, what the problem is there. Um, couple of the quizzes, uh, I, I have to reevaluate those a bit, so that'll change a bit, because remember I said I'd give you the highest of the two template quizzes, and, that, and we haven't done that yet. So this is not obviously going to be perfect. This is just to give you a general feel for where you're at, uh, to know whether you need to come in and meet with me and get some extra work and some things. Those of you that, you know, care about your grades, you know, that, you know, you want to have a 3.9 GPA when you leave, come in and we'll work with you on that. Obviously, the thing I care about is that something you learned here will change your life 20 years from now. That's what's the important thing. So if you're not worried about, you know, the actual letter grade you get, that's fine. But I hope that this is a rough approximation for your general effort in the class, okay? A any general questions that are of interest to the whole class? If, if you have a specific question, wait and come up to me afterwards or email me or call me. Is there a general question about these that the whole class would like to know? The last one's on the end, is that what it's at or your... The, the, the total is, you should be able to, the total right now is 199 points. So whatever that is, you are out of 199 possible points. And then with some of your bonus work, some of your extra work, some, some of you are over 199 points. Okay. Another, any other general questions? 